180, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week, and there will be videos along with dress up days that students can participate in. Today was green for overall mental health. Tomorrow will be yellow for anxiety. Wednesday will be black for depression. Thursday will be purple for suicide. And Friday is red for drug and alcoholism. Furthermore, we have the National Honor Society. New members were inducted last week Wednesday during ELT, and the video can be viewed on the Southern Door Facebook page. And to conclude, Junior and Senior Prom Court will be participating in a charity softball game this Friday night from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. All right, thank you, ladies. Okay, so we had one of our fourth grade students, Jackson Krieger, who earned a Youth Merit Award in the Arts for All Wisconsin. There actually is a voting contest that's in place now where you can go in and select the youth vote and then the event will recognize the winning artist on May 15th at one o'clock p.m. It's interesting uh, that Jackson's um, artwork was called COVID Runaway. And if you look at the picture, it's really quite endearing because it has someone there with COVID germs running all over the place. So thought that was kind of interesting. Um, one of the first days that our new superintendent had a transition with me uh, also happened to be uh, National Breakfast Week in the elementary. And so uh, we had some students who won the contest and they were able to eat uh, uh, breakfast with us and get to meet Mr. Peterson as well as myself. Uh, the 21 year visual arts tradition continues uh, with huge kudos to Mrs. Barb Schreiner Schmidt. She has put together a virtual art show which is uh, showing each night on our Facebook page. Um, down at the bottom you will see pictures. She's actually this year taken pictures of each child with what they said is one of their prize pieces of art. So it's really neat. We've gotten lots of very positive comments from parents about being able to see that of their children. Um, of course, you were familiar with FFA Drive Your Tractor to School Day. We also had the state FFA officer out here. And so she actually met and talked with the individuals as well as doing that. Typically, we've had Animal Day along with that, but that's been moved now till fall. So we'll have an FFA event in spring and we'll have one in fall. Our forensics team, everyone who went to state ended up meddling. So we had quite a success with uh, <coughs> with forensics and so this is a picture of all of the, our, our students in the forensics. So forensics continues to be a very strong uh, co-curricular activity here at Southern Door. Packerland All-Conference Volleyball people were acknowledged since our last board meeting so congratulations to Nicole Norton and Anna Olson who were uh, earned first team and Aliana Dufek who is second team and Nicole was also chosen as one of the two players of the year for the Packerland Conference. We have a number of musicians that were eligible for state solo and ensemble and they too all took first in class A. Some of them competed in fall and some in spring. Um, it was a lot more work to be able to the virtual because they had to submit videotapes of them doing their performances and then those tapes were sent in to be judged. So um, it was, you know, these have all qualified for state and then state will be coming up, I believe, in a week or so. So congratulations. Um, our student represent representatives um, talked about the prom courts. So we have the junior prom court, which was selected just last year, just before we went uh, closed school. And then we have the senior prom court. They did elect recently their kings and queens. So Dale Swanson and Lydia LaClue are for the seniors and Brandon Kazmarek and Andrea Vandertai are for the juniors. And they are going to be having that charity softball game. They wanted to do it under the lights. And we do have athletic competitions going on that evening and they wanted everyone to be able to participate. So that is why the, the event is first starting at eight o'clock. It will be at the Brussels Community Field and Pavilion. So the community is invited. Um, but everyone needs to remember that since this is a school sponsored event, all of the school rules do apply. Our high school, again, I think this is the third year in a row that they've published a book and it's available on Amazon. Uh, proceeds from the sale of the book will actually go to a scholarship 
and we have about 50 students who have showcased their pieces of writing. So it's really neat. This was a collaboration this year between our ELA department with Ms. Tesca and our art department with Ms., uh, Mr. McCauley, as well as Joe Knoppen, which some of you may or may not be aware, used to work for the Door County Advocate. So his publishing and writing ability was appreciated. Uh, Rotary Awards were just announced. Typically what happens in a pre-COVID setting is that they are invited to go to either a breakfast morning uh, session on a Sunday morning or they are invited to go to the noon Rotary luncheon. Um, but we had these students recognized for achievement in various areas. So Brianna Kay for band, Suwani Patel for forensics, Josh Becker for art, Brianna Partika for choir and Brady Tooley for drama. And then the vocational awards are handled by um, the Sturgeon Bay Noon Rotary, Henry Holt for metals fabrication, Sam Burr for woods, Charity Kohler for ag, Dale Swanson for stem, Luke Bosley for fab lab, Brooklyn Olson and Hannah Price for graphic design and Natalie Jandron <coughs> for business and information technology. Um, the young ladies also mentioned the National Honor Society. We had 22 members that were inducted. It was a virtual ceremony. And so um, these students represent high standards of scholarship, service, leadership, and character. And so they do a great job of representing us and also continuing the tradition. Some recognitions since our last board meeting, uh, Deb Deemer was chosen to be part of a coaches panel at the Summer Bridges Leadership Institute. She will be talking about the curriculum processes that we have put in place, not only for Bridges, but for our other adoptions. And then uh, we received word last week that we were one of 28 schools in the state to receive $25,000 to expand our elementary and middle school fab labs. This is the fourth fab lab grant that we have received. So we've been pretty successful. And one of the individuals from the WEDC and their marketing person will be visiting us on May 20th because uh, to quote, they have a hard time believing that our elementary students are doing the awesome things that they're doing. So they're coming out to see it uh, firsthand. So that's great because many of the other elementary programs that you will hear doing STEM or STEAM tend to do more arts and crafts projects, but ours are actually doing engineering and design projects. Uh, the district was selected for an AmeriCorps program that's going to allow us to continue the farm to school work. And one of the exciting things, which we just kicked off last week, it will have a short turnaround this year. Next year, we'll have a little more time to advertise it, is that our farm to school committee came up with and worked with Avians uh, that our high school students will have the opportunity to sell a hog or a steer to us and that will be used in our food service program. They have to complete an essay, and the essay is how do locally grown agriculture products offered in school lunches benefit students, and how would you suggest that the farm to school program promote the use of the meat from your animal and agriculture to your peers and younger members of the district and the families. So they have a short turnaround time, about two weeks, and the farm to school committee will be meeting on May 20th and we'll choose uh, the winner of that, and then we'll wait till August to uh, pick up the animal and have it be part of our program. Uh, our district also earned an excellence award from the School of Public Relations. This was for our video for remodeling and um, that was done with the referendum, and it, we received um, the award of excellence at a virtual ceremony, so this was a neat way to be able to celebrate. It still probably isn't as good as having actual people come into the building. So hopefully, I told Mr. Peterson, that can be something we can do next fall and invite our community in. The Golden Hearts Volunteer Ceremony. Um, I was surprised to see uh, that our eighth grade tech ed program actually made the awards for uh, the program. They did those flower boxes and then Moz put the flowers inside and they did an awesome job on that. I believe the project started out in the high school and the high school is already doing lots of projects for the community. So they turned it over to the eighth grade and one of the students uh, told one of the ladies who picked up the, the um, flower boxes that it was exciting because they got to use new tools they had never used before. 
And then congratulations to Brady Tooley, who was the Youth Volunteer of the Award, and I was very uh, honored to receive the Lifetime Service Award. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Um, donations tonight, we just have a few. Uh, Zorb's Paint uh, donated some uh, 15 containers of paint, about $200 worth, for the high school student council for that mural. Ms. When are we gonna, when is the mural expected to be done? Do we know? Uh, it's going to go into next year, but they're gonna start sketching like these next two weeks. Okay, okay, great, we'll have to check it out. Uh, Donors Choose donated about $500 worth of robotics materials so that our remote learners could also participate with robotics at home. And then the Door Kiwani Retired Teachers Association donated a DVD called Decoding the Driftless to our high school science department. Mm -hmm. Some upcoming events. Uh, Wednesday is uh, School Nurses Day nationally, so we'll be celebrating that day with our school nurses. You'll see Kendall LeClue in the middle, who is our RN, and then Kim Moore and Leah Hoffman are both LPNs. They also work in other schools in Door County, but they pinch it here when Kendall can't be here. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters will have a fundraiser at the ball game on Sunday, May 16th. Um, so that will be at all of the Door County uh, baseball games. So if you go to Colburg or Maplewood, please be sure to contribute. And then just a reminder that we are partnering again with Gardner uh, Town for a recycling event on Saturday, June 5th in the high school parking lot. And then lastly tonight, uh, you will be certifying our graduates because the next time that we get together, they will have graduated. So um, this is just a list of all of our graduates. So we wish them the very best. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, it is now time for the workshop on continuity of learning. Okay. So there are four, four things we're going to kind of go through tonight. Uh, one is the staff survey results. If you'll recall at the last meeting, I gave you the parent survey results. I'll be doing staff survey results this time, and then in June we'll do the student uh, results. Um, we also are going to have our tech team give you an update on our technology lease. Um, we have been using a leasing technology every five years to be able to meet all of our technology needs. Um, Mr. Vandertai is unable to be here this evening, so I will be just briefly covering the AGR, which is a renewal of uh, the five-year contract. Again, we've been doing this every five years. And then just a few updates uh, to our Fly Like an Eagle uh, re-entry plan based on some questions from board members and some community conversations. So with that, um, the staff survey will now be done around every February. It's a check-in survey, so it's a lot shorter than the surveys we've done in the past. Um, it really focuses on the fact that if staff are engaged, then students are engaged, and then we have improved student outcomes. So we had about 65% of our staff participating. Um, that's about 124 staff members. Uh, most of the, about half of the staff members who took the survey were classroom teachers, and you can see it goes down from there. And also when you looked at years of experience, it was pretty even across the board, although we did have uh, higher numbers between those that are one to two years in the district and those that are more than 10 years in the district. So the staff was asked, just like parents were, to what extent do you agree with each statement, with five being strongly agree, four agree, and then down to one is strongly disagree. Um, this was work day, having healthy working relationships with their coworkers. You'll see most of those, 97% agree. The, and then feeling safe at work, sharing input with their supervisor, looking forward to going to work, having the resources to do their job were all above that 80%. The one, uh, which is probably not a surprise given this year with the synchronous learning and all of the things with extra cleaning and stuff that's taken place, was that the amount of work I'm asked to do is reasonable and manageable. So that was kind of expected that that might be lower and school perception says that's pretty much a trend in the other schools. The environment, uh, staff doing a good job of educating students is high. Uh, training professional development came in second. Our students are respected. Um, they received useful feedback. 
some of the other areas and again this kind of depends each of the principals have been asked to look at their individual school results this is the district as a whole to see where they fall in these last three areas uh, information important to my work is shared with me staff input is valued and the handling of student discipline so those particularly when we shared this with the staff those are three areas that they'll be focusing on with their own school results to see if they are higher than that or if they you know that was a concern area in support the district being a good place to work feeling supported by their supervisor the district heading in the right direction uh, community support for the school district being recognized when they do a good job again there was some input from a broad group of staff members and then um, this is not a surprise either this was taken before we said that the new compensation study was happening so the district's pay practices are fair are 44 percent and when I met with some staff after this they pretty much agreed that had this been done after the compensation study the board just put in the answers might have reflected differently and then they were asked to give future planning priorities just like the students were in this and the parents and it was interesting that the top th uh, three out of the four were the exact same ones that parents had recruit retain high quality staff maintain the class sizes expand social emotional mental health services for students and expand services for students who have difficulties in learning I think with the parents there was also an area of more technical um, and college ready courses being offered so this improved the career and technical education was a little bit higher for parents so that's just a high level overview like I said most of the uh, survey results are being handled at the <coughs> building level and the board now that we'll be doing this on an annual basis you'll be able to have uh, you know more continuous feedback this is the question that was chosen on the progress portrait um, as a satisfaction and it was all things considered the district is a good place to work we were just one percent lower than where we were three years ago so that's not a statistical difference and again we have you know significantly different people who are working in that sort of stuff but that's still is a very strong indicator especially when you look at some surveys and other uh, organizations so with that I'm going to turn it over to our technology team and I'm going to pull up their PowerPoint okay all right good evening everybody uh, today we're going to talk about the southern door technology uh, five-year lease that we are um, going to be coming to the board for this will be our third technology lease and subsequently it'll be for the next five years 2021 through 2026 so we'll do a brief reflection on the previous two leases and then uh, move forward with our five-year projection for the 2021 26 time frame I may need to have some technical assistance because it's not moving off of the first one so Josh I'm doing everything I normally do All right. Keep going. Nope, we're good. We can stop here and then we'll oh, we move can. forward. How am I going to know when to advance? You just push the little button. There. <laughs> okay. Do that? I guess. Okay. <laughs> All right, so our team, uh, I'm the District Instructional Technology and Library Services Coordinator, also the Technology Department Co-Chair. Uh, we have Jess Meacham with us tonight, who is the Elementary STEAM Teacher, as well as the CTE Teacher Leader and the Technology Department Co-Chair. And Josh Klopp, who is our Tech Systems Manager, who uh, works with our Network Security and Infrastructure and is the District's E-Rate Coordinator. Okay, we're putting it back I'm on my switch screen. back. Okay, sounds good.
I love the irony of a technology presentation. <laughs> well, it's because you have you have someone who's not part of the tech team <laughs> doing it for you. That's why. It's okay. okay. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the contents of this presentation uh, are broken down into four different parts. So the first part is going to be the history uh, up through 2020 through 2021 school year. That'll be Jess Meacham. And then the overview, overview of technology outlook for the next five years, which will include the length of the term of the lease. Our timeline of projects and technology purchases and costs. So we give you a 30,000 foot overview of what that looks like over the next five years. And then our business manager, Candy Lukat, will talk over the financials, the actual um, details of the lease and benefits of utilizing Providence. So at this moment, I will turn it over to Jess Meacham for the history. So in the next few months, uh, maybe even less than that, we're ending the second five-year lease that we have with Providence. And through the last two five-year leases, we've been able to accomplish a lot in our technology environment. And so, Patty, if you can press forward. You'll notice that the first five-year lease, most of the projects were done in the first year. And that included a lot of things, such as uh, standardizing both the teacher devices so that every teacher had the same device as well as every teacher having the same software. In the past, prior to this lease, the first lease, uh, it, it, it varied from classroom to classroom. You could go into one classroom and you would log onto the computer and it would have a different version of Office or uh, Word and Windows. And in your own classroom, it might be something different. So standardizing teachers, teacher devices happened that first year. Uh, in, uh, increasing infrastructure updates, the things that you don't see but you want working, such as cabling and uh, Wi-Fi and things like that, uh, making it stronger, more secure, and more reliable. And then also increasing student devices, such as iPads and Chromebooks. And then the instructional technology that's in the classroom, such as smart boards and the panels, that became a standardized footprint for every classroom. So it didn't matter what classroom you were a part of, you walked in as a student and the teacher had the same setup as the teacher next door. And then of course, updating the phone system, which was a big deal back then. Yes, it was very old. <laughs> and, and along with the computer stuff, our system was such that if teachers bookmark certain things, it all went away every night. So every morning they had to set everything back. Bookmarks, passwords, thing. yeah, it was, a, it was frustrating. And so that those changes made your working environment a lot um, more predictable and reliable. The second five-year lease, you'll notice that the projects took place over several years. Um, I wanted to back up a little bit because I wanted to mention, I did a little bit of history. Uh, in 2000, 10 years ago, in 2011, uh, our internet bandwidth was 25 megabytes at our school. Oh my goodness. Okay. A year later, at the end of May 2012, uh, we increased it to 100 megabytes. And I found an email from Patty and just the thread, just reading the thread of all of the responses, like, yay, everybody was so excited, <laughs> increasing by that much. Currently, we are at 500 megabytes with the capacity to go to one gigabyte. Uh, I think, Josh, with, with one minor change? A change, yes. A change, it might not be minor. <laughs> so that, that, that also um, kind of paints a picture of how much progress we've made. So the second five-year lease, we have um, multiple years of changes um, instead of all of it happening in the first year. 2017, we increased student devices, uh, both Macs as well as Chromebooks, uh, updating the teacher devices because by that time they were five years old, and then of course doing some licensing. 2018, some of the older smart boards uh, were upgraded to become smart panels in some classrooms. And then, of course, some more licensing. 2019, we have finally achieved one-to-one achieved -one environment for our kindergartners through 12th grade. And then extending that to 2020 to our four Kers. And then, of course, increasing our wireless access points. So what has all of this helped us to accomplish? 
Uh, it's increased our teacher capacity as well as our students. Um, we're just finding that things are more reliable, it's safe, it's secure. Um, we don't have to guess if things are going to work. One thing that is, is big is when you walk from one part of the building to the next, your computer doesn't kind of glitch out because we have an expanded network that's wireless and it's smooth. It's kind of like that Starbucks quality. Uh, students have more accessible access to devices. We're one-to-one, -one, and that ties in next uh, to the next bullet point, um, helping our synchronous learning environment. And then, of course, everything is safe, secure, and reliable. All right, so I'm going to go over a couple of, uh, couple of the current challenges that we face. So every day I come in and have a great time, and you'll find that even though we got these amazing things happening on the back end and we got these cool upgrades that happen, we still have the dun-dun-dun-dun challenges that go with it every single day. So this little graph, actually, one of the things that Nate and I put in last year with the help of Jess as well is a new Think Help Desk program that allows us to challenge and see what kinds of issues are we facing. You know, is it a Chromebook? Is it the computer? Is it the printer? And it's how we track our help desk issues that we face every day. And so I spend a lot of time in this program every day. And this is just a little breakdown from a few weeks ago. I think it was like almost almost 2,000 tickets, something like that, that we've, we've brought in this, this year alone. And this kind of breaks up, and you can see there's a couple big chunks in here. And within it itself, you'll find that the biggest issue we face on a daily basis are the Chromebook repairs. That's that big blue chunk in there. And that is because our Chromebooks go on a five-year trajectory cycle now. So they get a new one in first grade, and they carry it first, second, third, fourth, and then in fifth grade, they get another new one, and again in ninth grade. And so what we find is our oldest ones, by the time they reach that fourth grade level, that eighth grade level, that uh, senior level, we find that these Chromebooks are breaking down almost on a daily basis, some of them. And so the need to keep them rolling and keep them smooth is really critical. And that's part of what this lease would include. We also see some of the challenges right within our teacher's devices. As Jess mentioned prior to, we replaced all these devices with brand new updated machines, but that was five years ago. Now the technology has shifted so much so and in so many different directions, and we need to make sure that our teachers are kept up to date with the latest technology as well to help them. And so we're seeing Chromebooks, we're seeing um, some very different technologies also in the classroom as well, where again, Jess said, oh look, we, we merged it, we matched it. Well, now we have some classrooms as well. And again, that, that represents itself in the, in the diagram here is that we've got some Chromebooks down at the elementary and middle school where they have the newer smart boards. And then you come down to the high school and we have the old projectors. And I can tell you, I replaced three projectors already this year alone, and we're running out of projectors. And so we need to look at how we're going to fix that. We also have some teacher devices outdated. The labs that we have here, our computer labs, our fab lab, the business ed lab are all running basically really old machines that just cannot do the types of things that we want our students to be able to do. So to be able to upgrade those and change those. And then finally, our phone system. And I know that this is kind of a funny thing because the phone system was so old and now it's this newer system, but in all reality, it does expire and these phone systems do become outdated. And so the phone system is something that I probably spend at least two or three times a month, I have to repair the phone system. In fact, I had a crash on it not too long ago involving voicemail systems. We got it fixed, we got it up and running again, but again, that's more time we have to spend trying to repair what, what might be broken that we could look at updating and replacing. So those are some of the challenges that we're currently facing as equipment outdates itself. So that brings us to where we are seeing the most success. Now I have brought to the board previously our Bright Bite survey, um, so I won't go over that aspect, but 93.3 repeating percent of this had increased uh, from the last Bright Bite survey, and we continue to see the positive trajectory uh, that we have had over the last couple of years. Um, so a couple other places of success that we are seeing, um, according to Bright Bites, which are proficient or above, our student and teacher access to devices at both home and school. Student use of the four C's, communication, collaboration, creative thinking, and creativity. 
the student and teacher foundational skills, confidence, and frequency of learning resource use, which is a huge testament not only to our tech reps and the professional development that we provide for our teachers and what's happening in the classrooms, but it's also a testament to the school board as far as that curriculum adoption goes and for Patty's visionary prowess in it as well. And then uh, student and teacher beliefs about technology use for learning. And to me, that is a, that's a huge aspect that we need to celebrate because we know that sometimes technology can be frustrational, and I'm sure we've all experienced that at one point or another, but the belief that it can be used for learning in an efficient and effective way, I think can't be understated. So the overview, what opportunities do we see now? And this is critically important, is that we have revitalized technology that teacher and student devices are going to be refreshed in this next five-year lease. Communication and security enhancements with our PA system, district cameras, and a phone system overhaul. This will bring us up to speed and up to date with the technologies that are out there and provide a safe and effective uh, environment for our staff and students. Life skills integration to make our students' college, career, and community ready. And collaboration with DC, EDC, and DPI, which we've just gotten in the ground level on. Uh, they're doing a broadband study throughout Door County. Um, and we're working very closely with them with the partnership and advocating uh, for our Southern Door community. So not just our students, but our families as well. So at this point, we'll bring Josh back up to talk a little bit about the timeline, what this looks like as far as the purchases go. We won't get real granular and too much into the weeds on this. This is just a higher level overview of what we intend to purchase over the next five years. So you can see where that lease money is going. And then we'll uh, bring Candy Luke out up to talk about the financials. All right, as Nate said, I'm not gonna get into the weeds because that gets boring after a while and we're all snoozing. So, looking at some of the things, the bulk of this lease actually takes place within the first year, the 21-22 school year. So we're looking at, again, that continued Chromebook replacement piece, making sure our students have devices that are gonna work and aren't gonna be breaking down every other day. Probably the biggest thing that needs to happen is involving our students, our children's safety, the PA system. The PA system is actually original to most parts of this building, making it extremely old in the world of technology. And it needs to be updated. We have speakers that aren't working properly. We have connection problems. Some can be heard, some can't be heard. Some of them are so loud, you just about jump out of your seat when you're sitting there. So we're looking at doing an update to the PA system along with the phone system, ensuring that the security and the safety piece is met. We're looking at teacher devices. Again, refreshing those things, saying, hey, teachers, we got something for you that's going to work even better than what you have. We're looking at fixing up some of the smart board panels and the monitors so that we've got something more consistent coming across the board. At the high school level, we've got some very old equipment that needs 10 plus years old that needs to be replaced. So we're looking at getting those changes made so that they're updated and correct. Another piece that we're looking at for this first year is the conference room. For those of you who have visited the high school conference room, the elementary middle school conference room, the district office conference room, they're all a little different. They're all set up a little bit unique and there's really no consistency across the board. And it's very cumbersome to have to hook up your system. I know poor Patty, when she wants to use her, her device, she has to put it on about four books high to get the cord to reach. And it's an old projector, and we like to get that repaired. There's also an old CRT TV hanging up there in the wall that should probably come down so before that falls down. So we just want to really make sure that we get those conference rooms looking good. We know in the elementary and middle school gym, we like to update the sound system a little bit better so that it works for them along with possible screens in there. Um, and again, software licensing is critical so that we stay in compliance with our requirements. The next cycle, which would take us to the 22-23 school year, again, those Chromebooks, so critical, so important for our students. Now we're looking at the fab labs, the computer labs. How are we going to update those? How are we going to keep those at the greatest possible levels to give our students the best tools we can to help them? We've got a few access points. I know Jess mentioned it's much more streamless, but there are definitely some dead spots in this building when you are traveling that we want to cover. We want to make sure that when we're outside, we're inside, we've got that network covered. So there's a few more access points that could be put in. Security cameras, I can't tell you how many times I've had people in my office going, oh, if only we had a camera right there. Oh, if we just had a camera right there. So again, we need to keep up with the current equipment we have, but we also need to add additional security to our system. Again, protecting and keeping our students safe. 
and software licensing mm -hmm. as usual. So you'll see that the first two years are really heavy on a lot of core things. We wanna use that money, we wanna get it working, we wanna make sure we give our students the best we can. And then the last three years, 23 through 26, again, continuing with the student Chromebooks every year, keeping that moving. We have some servers that are gonna need to be updated, some network switches that we're working with. Um, well, a big piece is gonna be some fiber cabling. Right now, the fiber cable between the buildings is actually its original fiber cable from several, several years ago. Um, I don't have an exact date on it, but it's extremely brittle. And when they did the renovations at the elementary, it was discussion to replace it <coughs> then already, but we're gonna hold off. And so it's important we get those updated because if those links sever or break unintentionally, we could cut off connection to one of the buildings or one of the areas. So those have to be updated. And I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I thought I had more on there. Is All right. Any questions at the end or? Yeah. Okay. I'll let Candy go. Okay. Now the most exciting part of the presentation, the financials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is another five-year lease. Uh, the district has done two of these previously. Um, and so we know that the timeline of 2021 through 26 is a reasonable length of time for our technology plan. Um, the amount of this lease will be $757,507. That is a little bit more money than we've been able to borrow in the past because of the interest rate. Um, the interest rate is so good, right now it's 2.99, um, and that maintains our payment levels annually at the 165.358 that we have been paying. So for budgeting purposes, that's a real benefit, that we can budget each year the 165, but know in the end we're getting a little bit more money overall for our projects. And that's been pretty standard and it's in the budget. We've had it in the budget for the past 10 years. So, so the lease allows us to um, budget more consistently for our technology purchases. Um, and, and there are a lot of benefits to doing this technology lease as well. Um, so you're saying lease as opposed to own. Um, it, it really allows us, we own the equipment while we have it, um, but then we are able to work with the um, Provident Capital to pick up the outdated equipment at the end. Um, they also maintain and audit the units with the serial numbers and all of the um, devices that we have. Um, they provide us with a detailed condition report. They provide data erasure and certificates of data erasure for our records at the end of the lease. So when we turn these devices back into them, um, we know that our information has been taken off of it. So when these show up again somewhere, if they're selling them on eBay or, or end up in someone's hands, they don't have our data on them. Um, and then really we're maximizing our return using multiple avenues of resale in this case. Um, they're handling all of that. We don't have to figure out how to um, obsolete and then dispose of our equipment because that's really not our primary, primary business, so. So in the end, what this comes down to is really the student benefit. Um, we want to make sure that we're continuing the momentum that Patty and the board have provided us over the last 10 years. And we want to continue that momentum with our staff, having the available resources, uh, as well as our students to ensure that we have the educational outcomes that we wanna provide. So the three main points are engaging our district resources to maximize the educational potential of our students and staff, empowering our families and community to be leaders both inside the classroom and as contributing citizens in the world, and excelling uh, Southern Doors viability as a destination, destination district for all students. So that would be our presentation on the next five-year lease. Now, I know that there were potential questions. Yeah, I, I mean, you might be able to answer this, as, or, or maybe Josh would. Um, he was talking about the Chromebooks, and I know um, they're not always the students' favorites. And are we shortening the rotation, or have we looked at another device that we may get better results out of? I just was curious about that. Sure, and that's a great question because that actually, that point was raised in my mind as he was speaking. So originally this four year cycle, um, with the technology that we originally purchased that four or five years ago, the durability of those resources are 
a bit outdated from, they weren't really built to last as long as the, the resources are now. Google had provided also an upgrade to their operating system as far as what they support. So it's a longer licensure with these newer devices than they are the older devices. So speaking strictly from an inventory standpoint, the biggest problems that we have are the ones that are actually getting cycled out this year. And we see a longer longevity with the potential resources that we'll be buying year after year that will still maintain our four-year cycle. And the data that we've crunched with that would support that data as well. Okay. So, because aren't laptops just like slightly more expensive, but they're more memory and maybe a little bit more durable? So for the capabilities that we're utilizing within our Google for Education suite, the, the memory and the RAM that we have inside the Chromebooks currently is more than efficient to do what the students are being asked to do. They even have the ability to do video and audio editing within the Chromebooks that they have now. So as I was saying before, the things that were purchased about four or five years ago might not be able to handle what we're asking them to do now, but the, the upgrades in technology that there have been, we see the longevity of that four-year cycle continuing the way that it is. Mm -hmm. So for the cost benefit, um, it's, it's much more cost efficient to do the Chromebooks, but it's also handling what we're asking them to do from an educational standpoint. Where do you think those most problematic ones are falling grade-wise right now? Like, are, are students who are in high school and doing more demanding classes and doing more demanding projects, are they, do they have reliable? Are they one of the, is one of the waves part of the older ones? So one of the older waves that we have is that fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade, but many of those devices is, have already been cycled out. As we see problems becoming more apparent, we've cycled them out for newer devices. Okay. So we've actually gotten ahead of the curve on that. Um, so we've almost pseudo-cycled out those ones already this year uh, to kind of anticipate those issues potentially arising. So say if there was a, a keyboard issue that we could easily replace a keyboard, we might replace that with a unit that's a newer unit for them to have better capabilities. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then one of the things that we have encountered, especially when you heard about the Fab Lab, is that you know the CNC software and some of the engineering software that's out there now is really pretty powerful, and our labs are not able to keep up with that. So we need to get higher powered machines in those areas to be able to keep up with that. So that's why you'll see some things with the labs. Yeah, there are, um, so that'll be one of the labs. Another lab with th that we're looking at has to do with like uh, music production and video editing and those type of things with the Adobe Suite that we also provide as a resource for the students. So um, the more taxing those programs become, the more apparent that it is that we need to upgrade those machines to ensure that we're giving the kids the opportunities they need. I think in fact you, there was some purchase of some special machines just to be able to do the musical this year and some of the concerts and that sort of thing. Correct. Okay, any other questions for Nate or anybody else? No? Okay. Be it resolved that the Southern Door County School District Board of Education approve the entering into a five-year 2021 to 2026 tax ed exempt municipal lease with Providence Capital Network LLC for the acquisition of technology in the amount not to exceed $757,507 with a lease payment of $168,358 per year as filed with the Secretary of the Board of Education May 10th 2021 in accordance with the rules regulations and policies of the Board of Education. Can I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Um, motion by Matt, second by Marissa. Is there any further discussion? What was that? It was seconded by Pamela. Oh, it was seconded by Pamela? No, it was seconded by Janelle. Oh, oh it was seconded by Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. We're throwing our voices tonight. <laughs> yeah. So um, I just want to say that uh, you mentioned the PA system. And um, I was the fifth grade teacher here. And I will let you know that every day when I started my class, I'd get the announcements for elementary school. And then I'd get to teaching. And then shortly after that, I got all the announcements for middle school because of the way the schedule was. I didn't really get the elementary. I just heard them from the corner room. And then I got the middle school loud and clear, which wasn't ever pertinent. 
So, I mean, just little things like that that really could enhance our educational opportunities because it was every day, it was like a super annoying feature, not to any control of any person here, but I'm happy to hear that that would be included in this. Is there any other further discussion? Okay, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. 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 Motion passes. Just want to say thank you to Patty and the board for your continued support of the technology department and our staff and students. Thank you. Oh, I wanted to tell Josh, I mean, all of you, but especially Josh, I feel like we were on Shark Tank and I wanted to invest in you. <laughs> <laughs> you, I really felt like I was the, the lady with the short blonde hair and you were trying to sell it. It was, it, you were really good. I, I enjoy getting up in front of people. <laughs> it's, you can tell, I did not, I don't know if I've ever seen that side of you, but thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, it is now time um, for the renewal of the five-year AGR contract. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Southern Doors actually had the SAGE program for quite a long time here, which allows the school district to have class sizes of 18 or less in kindergarten through third grade. Some of our local schools who do not have SAGE or AGR have made it a practice to have class sizes that small but for us the AGR program is the one that allows us to do that because uh, the money that comes in from the state is based on our free and reduced lunch population we get about two thousand dollars per each student and then that money comes into the district to spend on the staffing or whatever is needed to accomplish that reduced class size um, direction. So in 2016 to 2021, um, SAGE was turned over and it was kind of uh, reworked by the legislature to become AGR. Um, it had very similar criteria for implementation. Class sizes could be no larger than 18 in grades K to three. I think it used to be 15. Um, there has to still be the focus on literacy and math achievement. There has to be embedded professional development, uh, some family and parent education opportunities. That's why you'll see the family nights in elementary and the literacy nights and the math nights. And then um, there has to be a reporting progress. So um, back in January, February, you received a mid-year report and you have to have an end of year report that gets made to the board. Everything is done online, so everything has been uploaded already. And the report um, that we have is that every five years, the, the board has to renew that contract. And of course, that contract is offered to the school district if they, of course, are meeting all of the requirements for AGR, which we are at Southern Door. So the last time we did it was in 2016. Lori Connell was principal, and now under Corey, it is coming up again for another five years. When you look at the amount of funds that are coming in and the cost to put that extra teacher in each of those grade levels to get that class size, pretty much the funding covers the cost of that extra teacher. If we were not to have AGR, it would be very difficult for the district to all of a sudden hire four new teachers to be able to keep class sizes small. And those class sizes have been very helpful, especially with literacy and with math. So our recommendation is that we continue to go forward uh, with the AGR program. And um, for the most part, our priority is on the 18 to one. But we also know that sometimes our classes start out in August with 18, and so sometimes we have to have other options, which Corey has in his report. Okay, thank Any you. Any questions? Okay, again, this is another one of those that we've been doing for a while. It has worked well for us, and uh, it is something that we're very pleased that the state has still kept in place. But like I said, the contract gets offered to us because we are following all of the requirements that we need to do for that program. Okay. 
Be it resolved that the Southern Door County School District Board of Education approve the district's agreement for the five-year AGR contract and selection of utilizing the class re size reduction strategy of 18 to 1 in professional development related to small group instruction as the district's primary implementation strategy, along with the data-driven instructional coaching and one-to-one -one tutoring as secondary strategies, as filed on May 10th, 2021, with the Secretary to the Board of Education. Can I have a Hello. motion and a second? Pamela, motion? Second. Second by Kim. Um, any further discussion? No, I think these strategies are all seeming to work really well. I think it just continues to set the high standard. Um, roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 Motion passes. Okay, and then my last part is just some end of the year updates. Um, as you'll recall, last summer we spent quite a bit of time as an administrative team with teachers and also with the board putting in our Fly Like an Eagle reentry plan, which has really served us well. I was talking with the admin team uh, just yesterday, no, actually this morning, <laughs> I guess it was, uh, saying that you know we were a little nervous uh, last June when there were some schools coming out with their published plans and we were still working on ours and bringing things together and trying to collaborate and get as much feedback as we could. And yet we were the ones that opened up school and some of those that came out with plans already in June uh, did not open up school. So I think the timing worked out really well for us. Throughout the year, we've been monitoring and we've been adjusting the plan based on a number of things. Uh, we do weekly consults with public health, although now they've moved them to every other week. Um, and as well as the hospital, and um, they give us feedback on the, any changes with the CDC guidelines. Um, I also do weekly consult with the other Door Kiwani superintendents, and we try to look at you know what we are encountering, what challenges, where we are thinking we want to be as similar as possible, especially since we have children that may be open enrolling to other districts. We have families that are working in other places. So we try to be as consistent as possible. Um, in fact, uh, one of the superintendents in CESA 7 asked last Friday for there to be a poll of how many schools were continuing to keep masks going for the end of, towards the end of the school year. And of the 35 school districts, um, this is as of today, responding to that poll, only one school has made masking optional. And so our consensus has been to maintain the protocols that have made us successful and to finish out the last few weeks of school. Um, whether it's athletics, the arts, or activities in the classroom, we have made some modifications over the year. In addition to participating in all of our athletic seasons in their due times, one of the greatest joys we witnessed this past week was the return of choral and instrumental music in a live concert. This was an experience we had not had here at Southern Door for 550 days. With all the best practices put in place by our music staff, uh, which meant masking and special um, covers for their instruments, we were able to once again open up our auditorium and invite in limited guests similar to the way we did for athletics to witness the joy of once again hearing music created by our musicians. This was something we could not do earlier this year, but we were able to do it as, as the year moved on. There were some decisions that got made by a local school district that of course uh, brought some questions coming forward both from board members and from the community. So I've done some research and also talked with other school superintendents uh, about what would be some of the impacts if at this point we were to relax and not follow the health and safety protocols. So I'm going to ask Mr. Bosley to come up because he had a conversation with our Packerland Conference Commissioner. Um, and some of these things will be a little bit different than maybe what was shared with the board before, but this is the latest thinking. And I'm going to have him go through um, the impacts of not following the current health safety protocols from an athletic perspective. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, this has been a topic that has uh, well, honestly, we've been dealing with here for the last 15, 16 months. 
and every month, every week, every day, it takes a little different uh, flair, and a new question comes up, and you know we have some new challenges as well as uh, new things to discover, as well as new things to study. Um, with some recent uh, changes that have taken place uh, in our area here, uh, you know, we did um, do some investigating regarding impacts on uh, face covering protocols as well as, um, you know, the uh, removal of any type of uh, quarantining or, uh, you know, uh, practices that are um, kind of deviating from the way that we've done business for the last 12 months or so. Um, so I did have some conversations with our, our, our Packerland Conference Commissioner um, to talk about what specific impacts that could have. Um, and certainly it comes down to eligibility um, and the importance of uh, adhering to kind of a standardized protocol so that we contain, uh, maintain some consistency. Um, and that, uh, you know, we continue to, if we, if we want to keep our athletes eligible uh, and maximize their opportunity for uh, a full sports season as well as the um, availability for awards after the sports season, um, we need to continue and maintain where we are at. Um, basically, uh, you know, the, the, the conversation um, you know, really focused on, you know, what are we doing? What do we need to do as a school? And what's in the best interest of our team and our students? And, uh, you know, we feel pretty strongly that um, we've made adjustments through um, throughout the, the spring as well as throughout the past seasons that have been appropriate and really reasonable. That's been kind of our our barometer is where where is the reasonable element and um, you know we feel that with your feedback and with the feedback from our coaches uh, as well as parents administrators and others that we've maintained a, a pretty stable consistent and clear path and um, have done uh, it not without bumps in the road but I think for the most part um, a pretty uh, 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 about as clear a path as you could take on a muddy stream. So, um, but ultimately, you know, we've we've discovered and uh, continue to learn through this process, and um, it's uh, it's something that we learn something new every day, and uh, so. Could you, Steve, just go in a little bit because I know it's impacted another local school. Um, if quarantining is removed or certain things are put into place that um, would seem to be against what CDC is recommending or WIAA is recommending. How does that impact a school's eligibility for playoff or how does that impact individual players' eligibility? Yeah, that's there's, there's multiple layers to that question and ultimately what it comes down to is when we if if we were to deviate from our current quarantining practices school districts uh, down the road in within our conference could make a decision to say and they would uh, this would this is this goes without any type of hesitation they w if we removed our quarantining practices there would be school districts that would say we are not going to play you which ultimately then would impact our conference standing that would impact our uh, student standing for conference awards uh, as well as seating meetings for playoffs. But here's where it really gets really tricky is ultimately if we are operating under a system where we are not quarantining with the, the, the expectations of the WIA or the CDC and uh, kind of how they're marrying together and then we want to enter into the playoffs and we have kids that really by WIA guidelines should be quarantined but we are not quarantining because we do not subscribe to that. If our kids played one inning of one game, that we and and ultimately we were discovered, we'd have to forfeit. We would lose not only the eligibility of that game, we would have to we'd we'd be done. Um, but the, the the difficult thing is is where, what do you do and how do you how do you modify that? I mean, if you've got one system working and then you get into a tournament series where you're using a different system, 
how do you tell that senior athlete that says, well, you, you were you were okay during the regular season, but now with these guidelines, you are you need to you need to quarantine, and that that becomes a really difficult conversation as well as it becomes unclear, very muddy, very difficult to navigate. But you know, I think the one thing that this really does, uh, you know, is we have done such a tremendous job in keeping people together. From the very beginning of every decision that we've made, it hasn't been perfect, but we've done it in terms of, and we've heard it from you, we've heard it from the community, we've heard it from our athletes, we've heard it from others outside of our community, what a tremendous job Southern Door has done. Our athletics led the charge in the beginning of the year because they were the first out of the shoot. We knew that if we did it right, that that could set the tone, and I believe it did. And, you know, other school districts have certainly gone a different way in the last three weeks. It certainly wouldn't behoove us to go that direction because it, it, it serves, it doesn't serve any other purpose at this time than to divide people. This is a really divisive conversation uh, out in, in, in our society. People, are, we, we just want this to be done. We're tired, but, but folks, we've got 14 days, 14 days of school. And we really want to keep things, keep things on the rails. We want to keep things, our kids are doing great. Our athletes are doing great. We want to continue that momentum. Right now, we've got a full season plan for softball, baseball, track, golf. Any interruption to this could cause an interruption to that. So that's the bottom line. So there's also some other uh, impacts um, from the transportation perspective. This actually uh, was recently updated in March of 2021. Um, this was a communication from a lawyer with the Wisconsin Association of School Boards that uh, school buses must currently have face masks on the buses, both the driver and the passengers. School buses are considered to be public transportation and as part of the federal law with CDL licenses and everything, um, there is an order that requires face masks to be worn by all travelers while on public transportation. So um, that is one of the impacts that we would have to follow that we would not be able to change or a school that goes against that would not be able to change. The other one was getting an update from a liability perspective and I did contact our liability insurance EMC and this is what they said is that if a school was to remove um, you know, CDC guidelines or protocols that they are currently following they, and that they are currently adhering to, they continue to recommend that their school clients do that. If the mask requirement was waived or quarantines, our coverage would not be impacted with EMC, but EMC would have to defend the district against any allegations. Uh, their defense of the district would be made more difficult and possibly more costly to the district because a plaintiff could make a claim that the district was negligent and not following CDC guidelines. So that was, you know, a little bit of, a, of an update exactly from our liability insurance itself. So here's the proposed status of our Fly Like an Eagle plan for, like Mr. Bowlesley said, the last 14 days of school. Uh, to finish out the school year and then we have some summer school that's occurring as well. We have maintained and would uh, continue our indoor classroom, hallway, and our cafe procedures because we have close a number of students all together in an internal setting. We have opened up on site for concerts and for end of year ceremonies, including an in-person graduation for limited guests, which was something we did not think we would be able to do at the beginning of the school year. We have applied the current outdoor procedures. So those procedures were changed after our last meeting and that right now it just says that masks for spectators are recommended if physical distancing cannot be accomplished. So our middle school and high school phi ed and spring sports have not required masks for kids who are competing or participating in those classes. Uh, masking is optional, so it may be that some students are choosing to wear their mask, but for any outdoor physical activity, they are not required to wear their mask. We would like to, for the next 14 days, apply those current above uh, outdoor procedures now to elementary FIED 
when it is outdoors because we realize the weather is also getting warmer. Um, we would like to apply the masking as being optional to elementary middle school recess and also any other activities where a classroom teacher may take their kids outside. So that would be a step of relaxing some of those things based on the success that we have seen uh, with our athletics outdoors. So our planning process for back to school right now includes this. I know that there are some parents that want to know by the end of school how school's gonna look in fall. None of us have a crystal ball and we can't predict that, but we do know that as school gets closer to opening, we're going to have more information. So right now, administration has made contact with all of our fully remote families and advised them that if they want full-time remote learning next year, which is their option, they need to register with the Southern Door Rural Virtual Academy. At this time, we have about 25 students who have registered and they'll be needing to complete their registration in June. Um, the premise behind that is because it is the Southern Door Rural Virtual Academy, if they change their mind come next September 1st, that's fine. They would just come on site here at school. So they really have the best of both worlds and it's really giving families that choice. But for our staff, they will no longer be expected to be doing both remote learners and in-class in learners. It's a lot of stress that gets put on classroom teachers. So unless for some reason we're back in fall, the way we started out this fall, that will not be an option. Uh, we are obtaining staff feedback on June 1st from all of our employee groups as far as what really has worked well, what are some things we can eliminate, what are some things we can uh, relax, and what are some things that we need to put in place. Because we do know that this challenge has also caused us to grow as a school system. And there are things that we have done that are things we should continue, like live streaming the concert the other night so that someone in Oregon can actually see their grandchild perform. So there are some great things that have happened that we will be continuing. We're gonna have continued dialogue with health professionals and the superintendents are gonna continue to have their weekly meetings to check in on how things are progressing. We have planning sessions with staff and administration in early to mid-July to determine based on the feedback that we get from staff and from families what practices or protocols can be modified or eliminated based on the feedback that we receive as well as what the status is of the pandemic at that time. And then that uh, information would be coming to the board hopefully for your July board meeting with a communication out to families shortly after that regarding the start of the school year. That is our plan right now. You know, and as Mr. Bosley said, sometimes we go day by day, but um, that would seem to be meeting an appropriate timeline. So lastly, I'd like to say a thank you. I put this out in my open door newsletter, but for the listening public, a thank you to our students who have been very resilient and have risen above any challenges that many of us have not encountered in our life as young people, to our staff members, who have really had to grow professionally and how they deliver instruction and engage students, to our families who have been very supportive and at times may have been inconvenienced when their student has been a close contact, and to our community for its continued support of our students and what we do. We only have 14 days left and we plan to be consistent so that we can finish out this school year with students participating in the traditional end of year activities that they lost last spring. They didn't have spring athletics, they didn't have the special programs, and they did not have an in-person graduation. We can all readily admit that the end of the pandemic cannot come too soon for any of us. But while it still affects our community, we do have a responsibility to continue to follow the consult that we receive from our healthcare professionals. There's no doubt that many of the current restrictions will be replaced, be relaxed, or even eliminated for next fall. Those decisions will be part of the summer planning that will be done by our administration, our staff, and the school board. Just like last summer, they worked to develop the Fly Like an Eagle plan to reopen school. 
Even though the challenges of providing an education during a pandemic were not easy this year and at times inconvenient, it was really our working together as students, staff, families, and community that kept us in school every single day this year and allowed us to still keep celebrating the things about us that make us Eagle proud and Eagle strong. Thank you. Any questions? I do not have any questions. Anybody else have any questions? No? Okay. It is now time for the consent resolution agenda. For the consent agenda, the board has been furnished with background material on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. These will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and will be voted on separately. The board will consider approval of past minutes, April 19th and April 20th, 2021, expenditure revenue reports and current bills payable, check register, donations, Zorb's paint, donors choose, Dorf Kiwani Retired Teachers Association, certification of 2021 graduates, renewal of Avian's food service contract, amendment for 2021-22, renewal of new special education transportation contract, 2021-22 employee co-curricular and substitute handbooks, and 2021-22 co-curricular and athletic handbooks for high school and middle school. Would anybody like anything pulled from the consent resolution agenda? Okay, can I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Kim, second by Janelle. Roll call vote, please. Nancy Kirkle? Yes. Jeff Newport? Yes. Yes. Mary yes. Baker? Yes. Kim yes. Kim Carr? Yes. Kim yes. Yes. Motion passes. All board members have been furnished with a list of the upcoming agenda items for the year. Are there any requests for additional agenda items? Okay, then for my comments, I really want to commend Southern Door again. Um, I think that our ability to listen has really um, enabled us to be where we are. I know from a board member's perspective, it can be really difficult um, because people that call one of us are probably calling because they want us to side with them. That's probably right now a lot of the phone calls that I have fielded. And it is really important that we continue to make every community member's voice heard and that we weigh all of our choices that we make with careful, careful consideration so we don't end up making decisions that impact our students in a negative way. And I thank the board for, I think you've been fantastic, even though we have varying opinions. I think the fact that we can listen to our administrators and have really good conversations and that we work together as a team is part of the reason why I think that we've done the best in the area if you know, I got phone calls, well, this school is doing this, we should do that. And I wanted to, like, in my head, I'm thinking, we didn't do what other schools were doing when school was opening. And if we did, you probably would have been mad at us. So I think that we need to continue to lead the way and make decisions carefully and continue to, I don't know, do our whole fly like an eagle. Like there's been times where, you know, I've had conversations where I'm like, no, we're actually kind of soaring through this pandemic that because of really good leadership in the district in a lot of different places, we're in the place that we are with 14 days of school left. We haven't shut down. The other night at the baseball game, I was at the baseball game, the softball game and the track and field event. I was so proud of our students, our school, our administration, that we were able to be there in person watching these kids compete and people seemed very happy. It was a great, a great time. So I'm really happy with what we have in place and I think we have a great team to make our plans for next year. So on that note, I need a motion to waive the reading for adjournment to executive session. So moved. Second. 
Who is my motion? Pamela, second by Josh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. We will be going into closed session to discuss a, uh, closed minutes April 19th and April 20th, 2021, and personnel. Can I have a motion and a second to adjourn to executive session? We'll moved. Second. Motion by Kim, second by Matt. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We, the meeting is adjourned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The We're going to closed session. We're not adjourned. <laughs>